Thomas Sowell, uh, senior fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University, an economist and social theorist, he writes these words. The reason so many people misunderstand so many issues is not that these issues are so complex, but that people do not want a factual or analytical explanation that leaves them emotionally unsatisfied. I thought that was a very concise explanation of how people are dealing with the current issues of our day. The death of George Floyd, as tragic as it was, became the trigger for what has now become a national protest with riots, with people uh, being killed. One person, in fact, has claimed that the death of George Floyd has become more important than the life and death of Martin Luther King Jr., which is a pretty big claim to make. As we see the unrest continue to spread and more people taking things into their own hands, uh, just look at the example of the, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, known as CHAZ, in Seattle. People have literally taken over blocks of the city. In other parts of our country, we see continued rioting, building of burnings, shootings, of people, of law enforcement. Uh, there are several more deaths at the hand of law enforcement. Uh, we see the politics going on. Uh, there is so much going on that concerns many people. And you have to wonder, where is this all leading to? Now, if you've been uh, following social media or watching the news, uh, watching interviews, uh, there is so much that is being uh, thrown at us. And uh, there are terms also that are thrown around, uh, and I, I would venture to guess that maybe not everyone is very clear about what all these terms are and what they represent. And another question is, how much do I need to know about all these things that are being discussed? There are many who are speaking out on social media, and I, and I am sure that you you have friends or people that you know who have been posting things, articles, uh, statements, quotes, uh, advocating for support uh, for organizations like Black Lives Matter, uh, other organizations that are uh, leveraging these events to raise funds and awareness. Uh, and that's understandable. These things do happen when uh, things like this happen. Uh, but my, my question that I want to raise is, um, when, you, when you think of uh, those who we would say are Christians, uh, they are well-intentioned, they are well-meaning, uh, posting links and pleas for others to speak out against the injustice that the black community is facing. Uh, and, we, and we, like I mentioned, we feel even some measure of pressure to speak out because we see very clearly it has been stated that to be silent is to be complicit. In other words, if you don't say anything, you are guilty of the very things uh, that have brought about all these issues. I'm going to list a, a series of terms, and I want you to, I want you to just ask yourself, what do you know about these terms? Critical race theory, white privilege and white supremacy, intersectionality, cultural Marxism, wokeness, standpoint epistemology, microaggressions, racism, ethnocentrism, distributive justice, narratival truth, post-modernity. Those are just some of the terms that you need to understand in terms of the sociological and philosophical framework of uh, how you understand and interpret what is going on today. Uh, yet I'm not sure how many of us even know what these terms mean, much less how they're being employed to justify the thinking and actions that are driving much of what is taking place around us today. One example of a lack of awareness uh, that some might show is uh, there's a passion, there's a desire to support uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, how many have actually taken the time to go and look at the organization, uh, their website, and to see what they believe and represent? Uh, I shared this with our college students uh, this past Friday. Uh, we actually went to the uh, website and they have a section where it says what we believe and I just want to read through it because uh, these are some of the things that if you if you actually are aware of uh, would you be okay with 
this is from the website blacklivesmatter.com slash what dash we dash believe if you want to look at it. They say these are the results of our collective efforts. The Black Lives Matter Global Network is as powerful as it is because of our membership, our partners, our supporters, our staff, and you. Our continued commitment to liberation for all Black people means we are continuing the work of our ancestors and fighting for our collective freedom because it is our duty. Every day we recommit to healing ourselves and each other and to co-creating alongside comrades, allies, and family a culture where each person feels seen, heard, and supported. We acknowledge, respect, and celebrate differences and commonalities. We work vigorously for freedom and justice for black people, and by extension, all people. We intentionally build and nurture a beloved community that is bonded together through a beautiful struggle that is restorative, not depleting. We are unapologetically black in our positioning. In affirming that black lives matter, we need not qualify our position. To love and desire freedom and justice for ourselves is a prerequisite for wanting the same for others. We see ourselves as part of the global black family and we are aware of the different ways we are impacted or privileged as black people who exist in different parts of the world. We are guided by the fact that all black lives matter regardless of actual or perceived sexual identity, gender identity, gender expression, economic status, ability, disability, religious beliefs or disbeliefs, immigration status or location. We make space for transgender brothers and sisters to participate and lead. We are self-reflexive and do the work required to dismantle cisgender privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women who continue to be disproportionately impacted by trans antagonistic violence. We build a space that affirms black women and is free from sexism, misogyny and environments in which men are centered. We practice empathy. We engage comrades with the intent to learn about and connect with their contexts. We make our spaces family friendly and enable parents to fully participate with their children. We dismantle the patriarchal practice that requires mothers to work double shifts so that they can mother in private even as they participate in public justice work. We disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. We foster a queer affirming network. When we gather, we do so with the intention of freeing ourselves from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking, or rather the belief that all in the world are heterosexual unless she or he or they disclose otherwise. We cultivate an intergenerational and communal, communal network free from ageism. We believe that all people, regardless of age, show up with the capacity to lead and learn. We embody and practice justice, liberation, and peace in our engagements with one another. Now, that, that's uh, a lot to have to read through, uh, but as you were listening, you know, there are some things that I think we could say we would affirm uh, in general, uh, but there are definitely some particulars that uh, would seem troubling. Now, I know that for some people, they, have, they are aware of these things, so they'll say, I don't support the organization, but I support the principle of uh, Black Lives Matter. And, and that's fine, because Black lives do matter, and they are facing various challenges. We should be concerned that there is injustice, that there's prejudice, partiality taking place in our society. But we have to be careful that we are not thinking like the world does regarding these issues. In fact, we have to be careful as Christians to consider the foundations of what we believe, and then how do we respond to these things? Now, I, I have been reading uh, the literature across the board, uh, watching videos, listening to interviews, and, and this really, in some ways, has been an extension of my doctoral project, uh, because uh, I was trying to define what it means to be Asian American, uh, as that's one of the uh, factors of what uh, I'm trying to address in my dissertation. And uh, I was having a hard time, because how do you define that kind of identity? Uh, when there are so many degrees and so many shades and so many different experiences uh, based on the individuals that would 
call themselves Asian American. Now, if we were to ask, what does it mean to be a black person today? I think that would be a very difficult question to ask as well. And so when we say black lives matter, uh, what do we exactly mean by that? It's a very challenging and a, and a very difficult topic to address uh, because there's also so much emotion, uh, you know, based on the experiences that people have had. And some people have had some terrible experiences. I've had terrible experiences too. Many people have had terrible experiences. But collectively here, when we look at this uh, statement, this uh, doctrinal statement of uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, it, it, it's very, very challenging to think that now there seems to be some authoritative kind of um, uh, presentation that is dictating now how all people are to respond, whether you are Black or not. Now, I, I'm aware that everyone might not know the terminology and definitions of all these things, and uh, I, I think most people are simply affected uh, by the impact uh, of all these things taking place around us. But we need to be careful that we don't allow our understanding of truth to be ultimately determined by how we feel or just by what we experience. And if we ignore the reasonableness of God's truth, uh, we might find ourselves in big trouble. Now, some might ask, do I have to read and understand all these issues? Well, uh, I think before you do all the reading for those things, I want to ask you, where are your foundations? What are the foundational presuppositions that undergird not only your worldview, but also undergirds and provides a foundation for the very heart of why you think the way you do? why you say the things that you say, why you do the things that you do. The motivations of our heart are ultimately going to be revealed by the fruit of our lips, by the fruit of our actions, what really comes out of our lives. And, and what you're really seeing today is the fruit of what comes when people have grounded their lives uh, in these foundational presuppositions that they would ultimately believe. Now, today I want to get to the heart level of what really needs to be considered. Uh, I'm following up from last week. Uh, I thought it would be important for us to maybe spend a little more time addressing this issue, but from a foundational level. How do we frame these things? How do we look at what's going on in our, uh, around our world? And what are the principles that really are going to undergird my response? So last week we looked at Matthew 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Many pastors have been preaching from this passage recently because it is a passage that obviously is relevant to our times. But I want to continue and follow up last week's uh, message with actually the next verse. Micah 6, 9, and provide some thoughts that will hopefully challenge you to think a little deeper as to the heart motivations that drive what you know, that drive how you think, and ultimately, uh, how do you define wisdom in working through these issues and then in taking action? So let's look at Matthew, uh, Micah 6, 9. It says this, the voice of the Lord will call to the city. And it is sound wisdom to fear your name. Hear, O tribe, who has appointed its time. Now, if we put this together with Matt, uh, Micah 6, 8, we understand these things. The Lord has told us what is good. It is God who defines what is good. The Lord has told us what he requires. If you say that you are a Christian, God has made it abundantly clear this is what I want you to do. He wants us to do justice. He wants us to love kindness, and he wants us to walk humbly with him. What else does he want us to do? It says the voice of the Lord has called out and declared that it is sound wisdom to fear his name, to hear what he has to say. Now, in the context of Isaiah, Isaiah is warning the people of Israel and what is their fundamental problem? 
it is that they have failed to fear the Lord. It's no surprise that you see this downward spiral in Israel's history as the fear of the Lord diminishes and it leads to idolatry and immorality and ultimately the downfall of the nation. Now, we are not saying that America is Israel. America is not a theocracy and it is not governed uh, formally by the truth of the Bible, though we would say that there are Judeo-Christian roots but we can see there's similar problems when it comes to why we have a downward spiral as well in our society. It's because people refuse to listen to what the Lord has told us to do. The fundamental problem that is taking place in our culture today is that there's no fear of God. What happens when you have no fear of God? Well, you can study the scriptures and the history of Israel and the nations. This is nothing new when it comes to mankind. Even for the nation of Israel, when you consider that they had received the special revelation of God's truth, Israel had a history of God's supernatural intervention. He delivered them from 400 years of slavery. He brought them to the promised land. He conquered their enemies, and Israel enjoyed prosperity and peace. And what, yet what happened all along the way, in fact? Even when they saw with their own eyes God's supernatural works on their behalf, there were some who did not fear him. In fact, many complained against God. And you think, how could that be? How could the very people who witnessed God at work not fear him? Well, I, I think this is a good question to ask. Uh, why do men and women not fear God? And what happens when you don't fear God? Well, that's the first point. When, when man does not fear God. Look at Psalm 36. Uh, starting from verse 1 says this. Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. For it flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. So when we think about those who do not fear God. What is evident about them? Well, is that because of me? <laughs> no worries. Uh, transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. This is why it's a heart issue. Sin is speaking in the heart of those who are ungodly. Why? Because there's no fear of God in their eyes. In fact, they flatter themselves in their own eyes. They make themselves out to be greater. Uh, and especially when there's a sin, uh, they actually see it as a matter of flattery. Wickedness, deceit. He has ceased to be wise. He has ceased to do good. And here's something that's very, very, I think, characteristic. When there's no fear of God before your eyes, those who are the wicked, they plan wickedness upon their bed. They set themselves on a path that is not good. They do not despise evil. You know, when you think about it, sin is always premeditated. It comes from a heart that has no fear of God and that actually plans to do wickedness. You know, the world says, well, you need to understand why there are riots and people protesting and why people are even angry enough to even kill. So you just need to understand that there is this resentment, there's this oppression, there's all these things that have been building up. Well, while some of those things might be true, how do we justify murder? How do we justify stealing? Now, there are people who are in their beds just waiting for the opportunity to do things that are evil, to, to go on the path that is not good. And there is no despising of evil. In fact, there is a welcoming of it. 
And there's no shame. We, we see uh, on TV people who break into Target and steal merchandise, and, and there's absolutely no conscience. How do you do that when there is no fear of God before your eyes? Turn to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. When you don't fear God, you will despise wisdom and instruction. In fact, the book of Proverbs uh, I've been reading it this past week, and there's, it, it's just so relevant because it portrays God's wisdom and those who reject it, who are the fools. What is at the beginning of knowledge? Well, when, when, you, think, when you think of just the whole concept of epistemology, you know, we talked about standpoint epistemology, and that's the idea uh, of when someone is uh, looking through the the lens of their particular experience. So, for example, because uh, I was born here uh, as a second generation Korean American, well, therefore, I look at all of life and I expect everyone else to understand that my viewpoint as a second generation Korean American, that all my experiences and that all the things that I've gone through, that determines what I see to be true. And you have to accept that whether you understand it or not. Well, if that's the basis for my epistemology, that I am the one that my personal experience dictates not only what I believe to be true and what I know to be true, but everyone else must submit to that, well, that's exactly what's going on with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. But what's missing from that is this, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What is the foundation of our epistemology? It should be that we fear the Lord. Our understanding of knowing God starts with fearing him. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Go down to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22, and, and here is wisdom speaking. How long, O naive ones, will you love being simple-minded? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. Turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you, because I called and you refused. I stretched out my hand, and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. Then when your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and do not, did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their own devices. For the waywardness of the naive will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. I mean, do you hear that? When you do not choose the fear of the Lord, you hate knowledge. And you will go the way that mocks wisdom. Where there is no fear of God, there is scoffing, there is mocking, there is the hating of knowledge. There's a neglect of counsel and a refusal of reproof. I mean, you, you know, to be corrected and, and to be shown that this, what you're doing is wrong. I, it, it just, you just watch the news today, and, and that is what is going around in our country today. And people are actually dying because of the foolishness of man, because of the refusal to fear the Lord. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man brings a snare. You know, when we think about the fact that people just fearing man instead of fearing God, what they do is they just bring themselves trouble. They actually get ensnared in it. Solomon, at the end of his life, writes the book of Ecclesiastes, and in chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes, verse 7, says, For in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness. Rather, fear God. Did you hear that? For in many dreams and in many words, there is emptiness. There are a lot of words that are being shared. There are even those who would say they have a dream. Solomon says, 
You know what you need to do instead? Fear God. The following verse says, if you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight. For one official watches over another official and there are higher officials over them. You know, what we see happening today in terms of things like corruption, uh, oppression of the poor, denial of justice, this is nothing new. These things have always existed because there have always been people who did not fear God. You see, I think that's why we, we would say this is one of the foundational presuppositional truths that you need to consider before you respond to anything. Why would you argue with people about all these issues if they don't understand and if maybe we don't even understand that there's something deeper, there's something greater at stake here. There's something that is very rotten at the core, at the foundational level. And this is really what we would call the, the total depravity of man. It's that every part of man has been corrupted. Every part of his thinking, every part of his understanding. That's why people are doing things that are just so irrational. I mean, why, why would you go up to a complete stranger and, and just start cussing them out just because they're of a different race? We saw that to this past week again. Uh, there was a, a white person who, who, who just started cussing out an Asian person just because of their race, their ethnicity. How does someone get there? How does someone justify that? How does someone just, uh, just go crazy on someone, someone you don't even know, and, and make accusations that are baseless? Well, it's because there's no fear of God. Ecclesiastes 8.12 says, Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. You see, there's nothing new. There have been those who have done evil a hundred times, and it seems like they get away with it. It seems like some have no consequence to doing evil things. We see that happening right now. But Solomon says something that we have to understand is a truth to bank on. Even if that happens, still I know that it will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. And I think that's a big qualifier to make sure we understand, to fear God openly. We, we are not ashamed to declare that we fear God more than we fear man. It says, it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow, because he does not fear God. You understand, from God's vantage point, it will not go well for the evil man. And while maybe humanly speaking, they seem to get away with it, they will not lengthen their days. They will be like a shadow because they will die and they will have to face judgment before God. There are severe consequences for those who do not fear God, much more severe than anything we could imagine here on earth. It will not be well for those who do evil, for those who have no fear of God. So, you know, when we look at both the Psalms and Proverbs, we call them the wisdom literature. When there is no fear of God, there is a rejection of knowledge and wisdom. There's also rejection of justice and righteousness. So what we see being proclaimed in the name of injustice and prejudice and all that, uh, it's actually a rejection of true justice and true righteousness. It's because when there is no fear of God, there is no real understanding of these things. In fact, there is no moral conscience. There is no clear rational reasoning. Why? Because there is a narrative that has been set. The parameters are drawn, and either you accept it or you are going to be seen as the enemy. You see, these things like systemic racism, white privilege, the oppression of black people, uh, that they need to be redressed with generational receipts being compensated. We talk about reparations. You know, if you are not willing to do these things to uh, basically make good on all the wrong that has been done over all the generations, whether you were a part of or not, whether your uh, forefathers were involved or not, it doesn't matter. You just need to accept these things to be true. You see, because if you're not, you're part of the oppressor group. 
And that's what's really just tied into this whole uh, idea of critical race theory and intersectionality and those who have been oppressed are, are the ones who deserve to be uh, uh, receive reparations for all the mistreatment that they and their gener gener generations before have received. But this is not a new problem. This is something that has been and continues to be what takes place all around our world. And that's why as Christians, we have to be careful. This is not primarily a social issue, a political issue, a cultural issue, a, a socioeconomic issue, a psychological issue. It is primarily a moral and spiritual issue. And it stems from a lack of fearing God. And as I mentioned, the, the theological principle of total depravity and the corruption of people's hearts and minds due to sin, that is at the heart of what is going on in our world today. In fact, if anything, the truth of scripture is being validated through all these things. So we've looked at what, what, what happens when man fears, when man does not fear God. So what does it mean to fear God? Well, I'm going to introduce that today, and I'm going to have to continue next week. But what does it mean to fear God? R.C. Sproul provides a helpful distinction between what he calls servile fear and filial fear. Servile fear is that fear that you have, say you're in jail and you're afraid of what will happen to you. It's the kind of dreadful anxiety where you're frightened by a clear and present danger that is represented by another person. Or it's the kind of fear that a slave would have at the hands of an abusive master who torments and tortures him. Servile refers to a posture of servitude toward a malevolent owner. And you can understand when that's the understanding of fear, uh, and those who were, in, you know, especially the black community, when you talk about the history of being enslaved, uh, that's kind of what colors just how they view so much. And so when we talk about fear, there, there is very much that kind of an experience. But in contrast to that, filial fear comes from the context of family. It, it's the kind of fear a child has for his father and mother. It's a fear that has tremendous respect and love for his parents and dearly wants to please them. There's a fear of offending the one that he loves, not because of punishment, but of being afraid of displeasing the one who is the source of security and love. When we consider what it means to fear God as Christians, there is a fear that is defined by a sense of awe, uh, respect for the majesty of God. We are not to be flippant and cavalier with God. We do not treat our relationship with him in a casual way. Yes, we call him Abba Father. He is our Father. We have uh, a particular intimacy with God that is precious. But we are still to have a healthy respect and adoration for him because of who he is. Those who do not know God should, should fear God, not only in that sense, but they should fear his wrath as well. You see, God will judge sin, and it will be a just and righteous judgment because it reflects his holy character. And when man sinfully rebels against God, he should be afraid. He should be very afraid of the judgment that God will mete out on him. Even as Christians, we should always remember to take sin seriously because God takes sin seriously. We should never treat it lightly or casually. That's why when we see passages that talk about fearing God, uh, you know, this is really at the foundation of how we are to view God. God is a God to be feared. If we are outside of a relationship with God, we should fear judgment. But even when we are saved, when even when we become Christians, there should be this inherent fear of God that is respectful and in awe of him and that lives in light of the fullness of his character. In Psalm 34, 9, it says, O fear the Lord, you his saints, for to those who fear him there is no want. You know, sometimes we don't understand that in fearing God, we actually will have all that we want. Psalm 103, 11 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. You know, that's one of the things that I think the world doesn't quite understand. When we talk about fearing God, 
It is really in the context of all that God has accomplished for us and done for us in Christ. And through that, we receive the greatness of his loving kindness. Psalm 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Just like it says in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that is in short supply today. Because people are not living wisely. Psalm 115.11 says, You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You see, when you fear the Lord, you will also trust in him. Because you know he is to be trusted. It says that he is their help and their shield. Those who fear the Lord, trust the Lord. We can count on God being our help and our shield. Proverbs 2.5 says, Then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice, and he preserves the way of his godly ones. Then you will discern righteousness and justice and equity in every good course. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will guard you. Understanding will watch over you. Did you catch that? When you discern the fear of the Lord and you, you discover the knowledge of God, he gives wisdom. And he gives wisdom for the upright. And this is what helps us guard the paths of justice. Verse 8. You will discern righteousness and justice and equity in every good course. You know, at, at the heart of all that is going on, uh, that's really ultimately the, the, the desire, the, the plea, the hope. But when you don't fear the Lord, that gets perverted, that gets twisted, that gets turned into something that is actually terrible. How do you know what is true righteousness and justice and equity? Well, you will know it when you fear the Lord. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the wisdom that we need is what is to undergird our understanding of righteousness and justice and equity. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. We, this is a, a familiar passage, but notice what it says after verse 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. You see, fearing the Lord, it, that's just tied into, you can't separate this. You turn away from evil. Fearing the Lord never justifies evil. You turn away from it. Proverbs 8, 13 says the same. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Yes, we hate the evils that exist in our world, the evils of injustice, of prejudice, of partiality. But we also hate that which is evil in terms of hatred between people, just the, the dishonoring of, of the, just the, the sanctity of life, to go up to random people and to shoot them and to say, you know what, I am justified in doing these things. No, you're not. You see, that comes from a refusal to fear the Lord. Those who fear the Lord love evil. It says pride and arrogance on the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. You see, the fear of the Lord is what guards against pride and arrogance in the evil way, the perverted mouth. You know, one thing that we see, especially now on social media, is the perverted mouth. People are, are, are saying things that are just, incredibly horrible i mean it's not just the bad language it's just the content of what is being shared it's evil but we should not be surprised because when there is no fear of god there is a love of evil proverbs fourteen twenty six says in the fear of the lord there is strong confidence and his children will have refuge the fear of the lord is a fountain of life then one may avoid the snares of death. There is so much about the fear of the Lord that is being shared in Scripture. 
that, that we need to give careful consideration to it. Where do we find our confidence? In the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. You see, understand when you fear God, that is where you actually are going to experience the fullness of life. Proverbs 15, 16 says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. You know, what, what really seems to be at the heart of the, the complaints uh, of the injustices is that there's an issue of power and there's an issue of materialism. They want reparations. They want positions of power. In Proverbs 15, 16, it says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. Proverbs 15, 33 says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom. And before honor comes humility. One of the things that get tied, gets tied into when you see someone who truly fears the Lord, there's a humility. Why? Because we look up to our sovereign God. We live in awe and reverence of him. We don't take things into our own hands. We, we, don't, we don't assume or presume that somehow we know better but we stay humble. Proverbs 16, 6 says, By loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. You, you, you see, in the name of injustice, there is just more injustice being that's just taking place and uh, everything that that scripture is saying here is completely rejected proverbs 19:23 it, it gives such a practical application here the fear of the lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied untouched by evil yeah these are hard days to even sleep now because you're not sure what might happen. When, when people are governed by a fear of God, that is actually what allows us to live in peace. Well, I'm going to stop right there because uh, there's a, a whole bunch more that I got in terms of what scripture has to say about fearing God. But I do, do, do want to say this. When you fear God, uh, and, and the third point that we'll talk about next week as well, uh, then you need have no fear. You don't need to live in fear of man. You don't need to live in fear of the circumstances. When you live in fear of God, there is a security. <coughs> Sorry, there's an assurance. There is a comfort. Because when you fear God, you, you are secure in him. I just wanted to really share that with you all because I think foundationally uh, there is there is much left to be desired, uh, and I think that's being exposed for a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people are scared right now. A lot of people are afraid. Uh, a lot of people are are unsure uh, because there's so much being said, and there's so much emotion. Where do we need to go back? Well, we need to go back to what God has to say. Yes, we are called to do justice. We are called to love kindness. We are called to walk humbly before God. Uh, but that really is all grounded ultimately in whether we fear him or not. Let that be something that you kind of think through. And, and I know later on, for those of you who are participating in the table for five, uh, I, I want to ask you to consider uh, do you fear God? I mean, before you point the finger at anyone else, do you fear the Lord? In fact, uh, one of the practical applications, uh, and I'll reiterate this next week too, is uh, before you even go on social media and try to, you know, make statements and do things, start at home. Start in your own family. Do you fear God? Because if you fear God at home, you know what you'll do? You'll conduct yourself in a way that reflects God's character. You will do justice. 
you will love kindness and you will walk humbly at home. How about with our church family? You know, before you even think about telling other Christians or other people what to do, how do you view the relationships even in our own church family? Does the fear of God undergird how you treat people? We are not a perfect church. I, I've talked to people who, who, who share their hurts, that they feel like people don't care. And I think it's true. There are people who don't. There are people who are insensitive. There are people who really uh, do not extend kindness. I think to some degree, we are all very capable of doing that. Before you wax eloquently and tell others to support other movements, how, how about we start at our own church? Do you share the love of Christ without prejudice, without partiality? You know, race or ethnicity can be an issue for some. But even within your own ethnic group, there is plenty of division, I would say of even hatred, an unwillingness to love, to serve, to bear burdens. You, you see, it starts with where we are. If each individual who says that they're a Christian takes a hold of what it means to fear the Lord and to live in light of that. Change would start with us. And that is the kind of change that would then affect a community. And when communities are affected, there can be an impact. But it starts first with me. You know, the Peacemaker Pledge, it, it really does come into play here. Glorify God. Get the log out of your own eye. Gently restore. Go and be reconciled. If each person just practiced that to the glory of God, not only would our individual relationships be changed, but I believe we would be able to be an influence and make an impact in all the relationships around us that people would see that Christians first and foremost love God. And because they love God, they will love people. They will love their neighbor. They will even love their enemy because we have been loved with the precious love of Christ. And that is what will make the difference in our world, to stand firm to that truth, to hold it with conviction, and to practice it right now where we're at. And then we pray God would use that to impact the lives of others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you have shown grace and mercy to us while we were yet sinners. That while we hated you in the rebellion of our sin, you reconciled us to yourself through sending Christ to die on the cross. You did not ask for reparations. You did not ask for us to pay back. Christ paid it all. He paid with his very life to save us from eternal condemnation, from hell, from receiving the righteous judgment that we deserved. Christ paid it all. God, if there's anyone here that does not know Christ, may you help them to see that there is absolutely no hope apart from Christ, that only Christ can save them from the condemnation of their sins. God, we look at this world and we see that people feel the injustice and the prejudice and the hatred. Those things are so true, but they're looking in the wrong places. God, we pray that you would help us to, to show the way through our lives and to proclaim the good news of the gospel, that the answer is indeed set before us. Jesus Christ has come to save sinners. We are all sinners. We all fall short of his glory. And there is no hope of our own that we can trust in to save ourselves. Only Christ, only Christ can save us. So God, may we heed what your word has to say, that ultimately it is those who fear you that can have confidence. It is those who fear you 
that will have wisdom and knowledge to know how to address the, the problems and the challenges that we face in life. It is only when we fear you that we can truly understand even what loving kindness means and grace and mercy and how we extend it to those who don't deserve it. God, I pray that we would be men and women who fear you, who walk in the fear of the Lord, so that we might then even know the beginning of wisdom and knowledge, that we would know how to address the challenges that we face uh, during these, these crazy days, and that we would be beacons of light that would shine brightly the gospel of Jesus Christ so that through all these things, people might come to know you and trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.